Good evening, I'm Ryan Bonazzo. Thank you for joining us. The medical officers of health for the Thunder Bay District and Northwestern Health Units have had their hands full this week dealing with new COVID cases and navigating the ever-changing rules announced by the provincial and federal governments. Alex Flood brings us their reaction and their plans moving forward. The Thunder Bay District is reporting 10 new cases Friday, including one new death, bringing the total deaths to 69 since the pandemic began. 11 other cases have been resolved, and the district's active case count now sits at 57. Ottawa and the province have been introducing a number of measures, including capacity restrictions, as well as mandatory PCR testing for anyone returning to Canada. Dr. Janet DeMille says while reducing contact with others is imperative, she doesn't believe a complete lockdown is necessary at this time. You know, the concept of a circuit breaker, I'm not sure I would call what we need a circuit breaker. I think we need to, you know, collectively reduce our contacts uh, with you know, one another um, and uh, increase our immunization rates, especially on the third doses. We don't need a, a full lockdown. We have the tools to, um, to, to manage this without a lockdown, but we still do need some measures in place. Meanwhile, the Northwestern Health Unit is reporting 24 new cases on Friday, bringing their active total to 81. That region has begun implementing several restrictions, including the suspension of extracurricular activities in the Fort Francis area for children aged 4 to 11. The NWHU's Dr. Kate Young-Hoon says the recent rise in cases is alarming, especially when not everyone is getting tested. This surge has come on quicker, faster than any other surge we've had in the past. Um, it, it is also because of um, lack of compliance, we are very concerned that there is spread um, and significant spread within, within the community that we're not aware of. There are groups of individuals who choose not to get tested, um, so we, we are not sure if there are cases that are being missed. Packages of five rapid tests went out to all school children in the region this week to help ensure in-class learning returns after the holidays. Rapid tests will also be available at the LCBO on Arthur Street in Thunder Bay starting this weekend on a first-come, first-served basis. Alex Flood, TBT News. Ontario has announced new restrictions, including cutting gathering sizes and slashing capacity limits to 50% for most indoor settings. This as COVID-19 cases soar in the province with more than 3,100 new infections today. Colin DeMello has all the latest details. Ontario is on the verge of an Omicron explosion. 3,100 new cases today. And sources say the government is expecting that number will double this weekend. And so, for the second time this week, the Premier is addressing the worsening situation. Nothing will stop the spread of Omicron. It's just too transmissible. What we can do, and what we're doing, is slowing it as much as possible to allow more time for shots to get into arms. Here's what the province is implementing beginning Sunday, December 19th. Indoor social gatherings will be limited to 10 while outdoor social gatherings will be limited to 25. The decision to limit people's ability to gather, especially during holidays, is an extremely, extremely difficult one to make. All indoor capacity will be reduced to 50%. Such as restaurants, bars, gyms, pharmacies, grocery stores, shopping malls, and personal care services. It excludes religious services, weddings, and funerals. Food and drinks will no longer be served at sporting events, concert venues, theaters, cinemas and casinos, while bars and restaurants will be forced to close at 11 p.m. That means the hard-hit service industry will be impacted again. The government says financial help is coming. We will be looking at providing uh, supports. Uh, we're going to be uh, targeted and, and look at necessary supports uh, given the circumstances, which is the capacity limits uh, differences that we've got here. The changes came on the final day of the school year, a day filled with uncertainty for parents and students alike who don't know whether they'll be back in class in January. Concerned about it, worried about it, but well, who knows? Definitely will not be great if the kids have to go back to online learning after Christmas. It's kind of hard to do like online school because you're, the teacher can't really help you because he can't 
like the only way you can do it is by a screen. So yeah, trying to balance work and, and home is going to be a challenge. While the science advisory table says the government does not need to close schools in order to control cases, the NDP is calling on the Ford government to give parents more certainty. We've heard this government and many others say a thousand times uh, schools should be the first to open and the last to close. But we haven't actually seen it, seen it play out that way. The premier says he can't make that promise. No decision has been made on what that looks like yet. We are simply not in the position to say the situation is evolving too quickly to be able to know where we'll be in early January. Meaning online learning could be the reality for the third year in a row. Okay, back here in the city, the Thunder Bay Police Service has launched a new PR campaign in an effort to get residents on board with the plan to build a new $56 million police headquarters. Chief Sylvie Hoth also gave local media a tour of the current facility to illustrate the need. Corey Nordstrom was there. Leadership for the Thunder Bay Police Service believe now is the right time to explore a new up-to-date headquarters. Chief Sylvie Hoth brought local media to the service's garage that now serves a number of purposes due to a lack of space in the main building. In addition to housing evidence, officers weigh and sort seized narcotics in a small corner of the garage, just feet from winter tire storage. And the shortcomings at 1200 Balmoral reach every corner, says Hoth. Because we've been so piecemeal over the years, what's happened is that in terms of our efficiencies day to day, um, we've probably in some circumstances made um, our processes a lot more time consuming. The recently launched campaign aims at convincing the public of their need for a new headquarters, estimated to cost $56 million. The produced videos include first-hand testimonials from staff noting the lack of space. Cubicles are full. We're full to the ceiling. Um, we just don't have any space. Council has three options for the police headquarters. Aside from the new build, there is an alternative to spend $10 million to fix the roof at Balmoral or add on to the current building for $64 million. Hoth claims that the new build would not affect local tax bills, though that's dependent on the financial option the city chooses. Hoth couldn't say how much this new PR campaign is costing. City currently has a, a debenture for the homes, which is coming due, I believe, in 2023. And currently, the city's budget includes the payments towards that debenture loan. When that comes due, that money still exists. And the opportunity currently exists for a capital project of this magnitude. Mayor Bill Morrow has been urging council to hold off on approving a new police headquarters and hasn't changed his mind. It's not something that I have supported uh, at the board level. We now have the entire capital budget request in one year. That's a change. Originally, we were only going to have five or six million to deal with this year. It got changed to deal with the whole 55 or 60 million in one year. Hoth will present to council on January 26th. Corey Nordstrom, TVT News. A 22-year-old Thunder Bay woman has been arrested again by local police for another violent incident. Brianna Nedamagisic is accused of stabbing a man on Windsor Street last night. Nedamagisic was charged today with aggravated assault and escaping lawful custody. Back in March of 2020, she was accused of second-degree murder and a Picton Avenue homicide. She was also wanted by police for more than three months after a standoff in November of last year. Netta McGeesick wound up pleading guilty to lesser charges in the homicide case and was released with conditions in September. Police say she was back in custody this morning for the stabbing and being treated in hospital for an injury when she attempted to flee. She was rearrested after a brief struggle. She appeared in bail court this morning and was released from custody pending her next court date in January. Thunder Bay fire crews were rushed to a house fire on the city's north side late this afternoon. The blaze broke out at a home on Market Street just before 5 o'clock. Few details are available at this time, but smoke could be seen coming from the roof area. Multiple units were on scene and fire crews appeared to have things under control. There's no word on injuries, but it appears at least one person was attended to by Superior North EMS. We hope to have more details on the late edition news at 11.
Three months after the big smokestack was toppled at the former Thunder Bay generating station, another piece of the power plant came crashing down today, courtesy of budget demolition. Three, two, one, fire. The implosion took place at 9 o'clock this morning. Budget site manager Jeremy Later says the crews had separated about 15% of the building from the larger section. Then they prepared the blast site with excavators and the metal structure fell right where it was supposed to. Later says everything went perfectly according to plan and they captured it all on video from multiple angles, including with drone cameras. The former OPG plant closed for good in 2018 after providing electricity to the area for more than 50 years. Later says the larger portion of the structure will be imploded sometime in June. The Thunder Bay Art Gallery premiered a special new exhibit today. It's called Indigenous Ingenuity, an Interactive Adventure. And today's launch included several guest speakers. Mitchell Ringos has the details. The new exhibition offers visitors the unique opportunity to explore and interact with several Indigenous inventions through collaborative games, virtual reality, interactive murals and more. The piece depicts how the ingenuity of the First Peoples continues to influence our society today. Using innovative technology, visitors can wear RFID bracelets that track all the exhibits they interact with. The exhibition was made possible by Science North and CEO Guy Labin was thrilled to work with the art gallery to bring in this one-of-a-kind exhibit. Interactivity is an important element. It allows for deeper learning, deeper engagement. You know, it appeals to younger kids or to older adults because, you know, there's some elements of fun and, and people learn when they have fun. So it's uh, something that we have long known and experienced and developed at Science North. Nishinaabeaski Nation Deputy Grand Chief Victor Linklater toured the exhibit and said it was the perfect mix of old and new. As he says, art has always been important to Indigenous people. And it really brought our culture out and who we are as a people. So art is such a powerful tool. It's something that's, uh, you know, it's a gift that is given. And, and when you share your gift, yeah, it always benefits others. Director of Operations for Indigenous Tourism Ontario spoke about a condensed version of the exhibit that will bring the same interactive experience on the road to northern communities. Everything they do and the expertise and their uh, stellar reputation and the way that they involve the communities and other partners in the exhibits and in their outreach efforts, uh, no doubt it will have a positive impact on tourism. And the interactive exhibit here in Thunder Bay will be open for their regular hours for the public to come see. But for the traveling exhibit, they're planning to head on the road sometime in the fall of 2022. Mitchell Ringo's TBT News. Mitchell's always up to something with his stand-ups. Well, the Regional Food Bank's Holiday Hamper Program wrapped up today at several locations across the city, including one in Current River at the Refreshing Waters Church. Dozens lined up to come and get their holiday hamper filled with a variety of food like stuffing, pancake mix, canned goods and more. RFDA Chair June Goss says between yesterday and today they've given out about 1,100 hampers. Goss says they had a lot of help from St. Ignatius and St. Pat's students to fill the hampers. She notes the annual Christmas drive will help out a lot of people in Thunder Bay during the holiday season. There is a forgotten part of our society, which are the seniors, singles and couples who are struggling to put food on their table every day. And this service is to provide them with a Christmas hamper so that they can enjoy Christmas as we do, as the rest of us are able to do. Gaw adds on Monday and Tuesday, they'll take the remaining food to the streets to deliver hampers to those who couldn't make it in person. After much anticipation, local skiers hit the slopes today for the first time this season at the Loch Lomond Ski Area. While only half of the runs are open so far, skiers and snowboarders were still excited to be the first on the hill. Catalina Gillies has the story. It was the long-awaited opening day at Loch Lomond Ski Area, and several outdoor enthusiasts tied up their laces and clipped on their ski boots to be the first to enjoy the fresh powder on the slopes. Both of these are my grandkids, and we've been skiing here for the last 12 years. Both of these uh, started out at uh, about two and a half on, on, on ski hills here, 
and we have a pass every single year. Despite the warm weather and some rain over the past few days, the conditions on the ski hill were perfect for excited skiers and snowboarders. I just love going down the hills really fast and the jumps. Yeah, same for me. Going down the hill super fast and getting fresh air. Mostly um, going down the Snoopy too. I love skiing all the time. For now, only the two chairlifts on the south side of the hill were open. Staff at Loch Lomond say they're waiting for more snow until they can open up the north side. Manager Alicia Cameron says there's been a lot of anticipation for this season and she expects it to be quite busy. We're optimistic that outdoor operations are going to remain generally unaffected by any new COVID restrictions that might come up. Uh, there's been a lot of work done since last season between the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Recreation and the Ontario Snow Resorts Association to ensure that we are able to operate all winter. Ski school director Andy Goss says the popularity and demand for skiing has increased more and more every year. He believes it's a great way for people to get fresh air and exercise, especially during the pandemic. I think uh, everybody's been... Uh cooped up with the COVID and trying to get outside and, and uh, wanting to get out and, and have some fun and enjoy the, what Mother Nature has to offer us here in uh, northern Ontario. Other than Christmas Day and Christmas Eve, Loch Lomond will be open Monday through Sunday throughout the holidays for all residents to enjoy. All they need now is a good snowfall. Catalina Gillies, TBT News. Well, Fiona, a little bit of a better day for that today than yesterday when we had that mist and uh, so icy. Still a little bit icy, but the temperatures have cooled off quite a bit. A little better for the snow. Absolutely. I mean, rain does not bode well if you've got plans to go out skiing. Temperatures like this, probably a little bit more so. Uh, we had a low this morning of minus 13 and wind chills uh, did hit minus 22 overnight. But uh, we only warmed up a, a few degrees. So we are actually a little below normal at this time of year. Minus 10 was our high, but uh, wind chills tapering off uh, because the winds are tapering off. Just minus 12. It was mostly cloudy most of the day. We did have a few uh, brief periods of a flurry or two, but definitely not enough to uh, improve conditions on the slopes. If we take a look at what's happening across the region at this hour, Similar temperatures to what Thunder Bay is experiencing, minus 13 in Fort Francis with just a few clouds. Uh, they too saw the gusty winds taper off. So right now, wind chills for most areas, not that much of a factor. It's only making it feel maybe one or two degrees cooler. So we head up into Knorr and Dryden and into Red Lake and Sioux Lookout, Pickle Lake all at minus 14 at this time. Eastward, we're at minus 12. Uh, for Armstrong and Greenstone. They've had light snow continuing throughout the day. Marathon matching those temperatures. And Sault Ste. Marie, a lot milder, just below the freezing mark at minus two. But they too have uh, got some light snow at this time. Now, here in the city of Thunder Bay, temperatures are only going to drop uh, a couple degrees from the high today, only down to minus 13, but the winds will continue to be light. So really not an overly cold night, relatively mild, comparatively speaking. And as we head into the weekend, uh, it's not going to be too bad. If you want a little snow, we got that. If you want uh, some milder temperatures, we got that too. And I'll have more details later on in the news hour. I'll take the milder temperatures wherever I can get them. Thanks a lot, <laughs> Fiona. Well, we told you about the uh, bevy of new restrictions that are coming in to Ontario. Those aren't the only new measures. There are new federal requirements as well for those traveling in and out of the country. We'll have all the details for you as your Friday news hour continues. The situation is, uh, is both dramatic and critical. 